I'm Jason Henderson, publisher with my partner Intro Yo at Castle Bridge Media, home of the Castle of Horror anthology series and actually books by several people who are here. Uh, David, we've published science fiction from you. Chris Arnone, we are publishing science fiction from you. Jennifer, I've been involved in publishing horror from you. So uh, this particular panel is on LGBTQ plus themes and sci-fi. Whatever you want to make out of that, but uh, I, I, I just thought, um, talking to other people, that it would be a very, very interesting conversation. So let me first introduce our panelists in alphabetical order. Uh, Chris Arnone is a fan of all things nerdy, and he's currently knee-deep in the Jayu City Chronicles, a cyberpunk heist series, the second of which, Necropolis Alpha, just came out this past week and is sort of the the event that that is bringing us together he's a senior contributor at book riot as an mfa in creative writing and he's an actor and poet and he's hanging around kansas city with his wife and cats hello chris welcome hello glad to be uh, here david bowles Mer is a mexican-american author and translator from south texas who i have known for like 15 years uh, he works as an associate professor at UT Rio Grande Valley. Among his award-winning books are The Smoking Mirror, The Witch Owl Parliament, Secret of the Moon Conch, and The Prince and the Coyote. David presently serves as vice president of the Texas Institute of Letters. Welcome, David. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And Jennifer, Jennifer Brody, who often writes under the name Vera Strange, is the author of the Disney Chills book series, the 13th Continuum Trilogy, and the and is a Stoker finalist for Best Graphic Novel for Spe uh, Spectre Deep Six and otherwise award nominated um, 200, prompting Forbes to call Brody's a star in the graphic novel world. That's really groovy. Uh, <laughs> her new series, A Sacrifice of Blood and Stars, sold in a three book deal and debuts in uh, the fall of 2024. Congratulations. And she lives in Joshua Tree, California. Hello, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Hello. Okay. Uh, this is a fascinating topic. Now, let me be uh, just in, in full disclosure. I, I do not identify as LGBTQ. I am a, a, a very old cishet white man. So my goal as a publisher is to be sure and bring spotlights to voices that are not my own. And um, uh, that's one of the things that that I've thought about and that Intro Yo, my partner, has thought about a lot over the last couple of years is we're going to write our own thing and we're going to bring in people who, to, to write stuff that doesn't speak from where we're speaking from. So uh, this is a fascinating topic. And I have questions uh, that a lot of you guys um, pitched in and, and I might have some. So I'm just going to act as a moderator and let you guys go where you want. Um, so let's start with uh, speaking of speculative fiction, which is another word for fantasy, horror, sci-fi, stuff that deviates from straight drama, straight literature fiction, um, why is the presence of queer and BIPOC, BIPOC characters uh, important to speculative fiction? I mean, in other words, why why even do this? Like, what's what's the importance of diversifying that that cast? Anybody wants to go after that? I feel like the simplest answer is everyone deserves to see themselves represented on the page, on the screen, on everything. Um, as an intersex man, I've yet to actually read a science fiction story that includes intersex people. Um, and it's so meaningful to people to see themselves represented on the page. I think if you're, if you grow up white and hetero and like, I didn't identify as intersex, I didn't understand that about myself till my thirties you take it for granted that everybody looks like you and sounds like you. And so to have people that don't, because there are people who don't look and sound like you that will see themselves on the page and that's worth everything. Mm. Yeah, we always say representation really matters. Um, and I think what's cool about speculative fiction is that, I always say a couple of things about it. One is that um, the representation, it doesn't have to be what the story is about. It just needs to be there and shown. I typically don't, not writing about identity stories exactly. Thematically, it'll come in, you know, but speculative fiction gives you this opportunity. I mean, I think there's a reason why the first interracial relationship was on Star Trek. The first Black woman in a television show was also on Star Trek. But mm. is that what Star Trek is about? No. And I always say it's the least weird thing about them. There's aliens 
as characters, and I say this about my stories, the least weird thing is if someone is queer or trans. And I tend to write a lot of stuff where all like a sacrifice of blood and stars, where it'll be like, the basis for discrimination is different in this. It's a military world. So, you know, whether your father was had a war medal, or your mother or deserted, that's discrimination. And that's the construct of otherism. Being trans in this world that I wrote is not a big deal. They'll say, oh, there's this weird blip on the radar where humans were totally messing things up. Now it's more of a bureaucratic name change issue and a medical, like getting your forms through the military because the book's kind of about Space Force. But it is not a basis for discrimination um, in this world. And I like doing that because I like to give especially kids this idea of a hopeful future mm. where the, tr the stuff we're going through now isn't forever that there is. And that's why I like Star Trek. There's this hopeful possibility because Star Trek is not dystopian. Yeah. Um, that there is a future. And I grew up in rural Appalachia in the mountains, never fit in. I'm neurodivergent, I identify as queer, always have. And my best friend and I in high school, we couldn't find this kind of fiction, especially for young adults that did not exist. Uh, the closest thing we could get was Anne Rice and Clive Barker. Mm. Because Anne, as you guys know, probably is a champion of this. Um, her son, Christopher Rice, is queer. Um, Clive is as well. And I, I know him and I've spent time with him and I love mm. him. And I think he's an absolute genius. Um, and they were writing, especially allegorically about things in speculative, fi speculative fiction. And what's cool is both um, my best friend and I grew up and we're both authors. She writes under Robin Talley and she specifically mm. writes queer YA. That is her thing. She's been nominated for the Carnegie Medal. We basically both write the books we wish we had when we were teenagers. That's, yeah, there's, there's definitely like an aspirational um, element to this. And, you know, when th there's a there's something about, you know, writing for yourself um, and, and especially for a younger version of yourself, writing the books that you wish you'd seen. But there's also an element of like writing for your community. Right. So <clears throat> specifically thinking about science fiction for the longest time and the, the golden age of sci fi, the people who were projected into the future all had a very, very similar, you know, identity. Um, you know, essentially they were like Jason Henderson. They were, you know, <laughs> cis at white people. Um, and the future, <laughs> they were the ones who made it. They, you know, and occasionally somebody would come along and like kind of like turn that on its head or so like Kayla Game is a good example of somebody who oh, did yes. um it's in and the left hand of darkness and other like really wonderful work. But um for the most part that was the future. Um and you know the the problem with that is that people who who are not part of that then um, it, it erases their community in the future. And the implication, of course, mm -hmm. is that people like me cease to exist. People like us cease to exist. And you know we we, we should want something different for our, our our future. And so writing futures and alternate presents and and like and fictionalized pasts or whatever, where queer folks are. Um, you know, we've always been here, but that, you know, where we're celebrated and we're openly participating in society, um, you know, shoulder by shoulder with um, with our non-queer uh, fellows is, is a, a wonderful thing. And the same thing is true for BIPOC. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, a, a really amazing writer and philosopher from Mexico whose name is Yasna Elena Gil. And she uh, is indigenous and she talks about how at the time of the conquest, her people, the Miche from the mountains of Oaxaca uh, on the border with Veracruz, um, they could have been excused from imagining that their time in the world was over, that they would not survive into the future. And that when they were, if it, for them to, to tell stories about themselves hundreds of years from the time of the Spanish invasion, would have been like speculative fiction. It would have been projecting themselves in the future. Um, and the fact that she is Misha and she's writing right now in the present and writing her own speculative fiction about the future, she says is is a, a, kind, a kind of proof of the way this works. Mm. That it is, it's because of the way conquest works and colonization works, mm -hmm. the, 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 the way this kind of flattening of identity works, it it is it is more likely that your group is going to be eliminated, and so writing speculative fiction in which we continue to exist and and become more and more a central part of society is a way of pushing back against that kind of you know flattening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think 
I always say it's it's actually a world building problem because when you look at the present and I look at the present, I live in California, but it's it's really diverse. The landscape and the tapestry of what you see right now and it, with communication and travel, it's becoming, I think, more and more diverse, including international. And when I look at the future, I see this trend continuing unless there's something like an ethnic cleansing or something, which would be terrible, but which you can explore in fiction. It has happened historically. It is maybe happening in some happening now. Now, yes, exactly. In multiple places. Exactly. Um, and I always say, like, when Hunger Games came out, and I looked at the billboards, I was like, this looks so wildly out of touch with reality. And that's technically set where I grew up, which is Appalachia, right? Mm -hmm. That's where her district is. And I was like, the future is so white, basically. Yeah. Which is to say, that's not what where I grew up looks like. Um, it is because of slavery and what we did, but there is a huge amount of diverse populations there. You know, my high school was probably 50% African American. And where is that? And so I always say it's a world building issue because if you don't account for that, this isn't what the future will look like in your world build. So you're actually not telling authentically a story that makes sense. Um, you know, and I think, People are really dug in right now. We have an election going on. We have, you know, he who shall not be named, I think could very well be our president again. Um, it is quite likely, um, is certainly possible. And I always say, you know, people are really dug in. If you watch the political polls, you watch, you know, the people who have their stances, they're not really changing their minds. But I think what's cool about speculative fiction is it's a way to explore these concepts allegorically in a way that you can actually change hearts and minds. And especially when we're writing for kids, right? Because yeah. they might be under their parents' control. I know a lot of us grew up where we weren't necessarily accepted. I know I was not, and I don't know that I am in some ways understood still um, to this day, but um, it gives us a way to kind of reach. So like I have the story that's coming out in a, it's a charity anthology to benefit medical issues in the Middle East right now. It's called Red Stars and Shattered Shields, all proceeds going to charity. And my story, and that's called Let Me In, and it's a sci-fi story. It does have a queer romance at the core of it with a girl. Um, but in the back end, we learn that her romantic partner is actually an alien who can shape shift. So it's kind of a lot about the construct of otherism and what it means to be the other. Um, but the story is also an immigration story. It's but where we reframe it, where all people on Earth are the refugees. Earth is climate damaged, it's dying. And so our characters are rescued from basically an internment camp where they're starving, they don't have water and an alien race, a utopian society sends a ship to give them refugee status. So the story picks up where they've been in transit for a really long time and they're about to reach this world and they don't know what to expect. They don't speak the language, they don't know how to communicate. And as they get closer, something happens where the they shut the atmospheric borders and leave our characters stranded in space with no food, no water, too far to go back to Earth. And this was absolutely inspired by the Muslim immigration ban. Right. Like, because I read about how people on planes literally had to turn around that were coming for life-saving surgeries for their babies here in the United States. But like I said, you're probably not going to change someone's mind. But what if we reframe it so it's really all of Earth? And then we're exploring what it's like to be a refugee going to a whole alien world in a sci-fi context with an interesting story. So I think, you know, those are the kinds of things that can reach or, and the thing I'll say on this is that, you know, I got Disney to let me do queer representation and Once Upon a Scream, Disney Chills is very diverse. I strive really, really hard um, in that series to show, because, you know, a lot of kids, it's in middle grade, eight to 12, and they're buying it because it's a Disney villain, right? And, and they know it's going to be a dark and horrible ending, nothing good. Ha Disney has let me kill so many children of, mm -hmm. even, swear to God, I think only one of my characters made out alive. You know, and it's like they're buying it because they love Cruella de Vil, who's fabulous, come darling, or Ursula, or, you know, um, my favorite is Maleficent. And, you know, in the Maleficent book, um, it's she sent to live with her aunts, that my character, because she gets in trouble in the big city down in the deep south. And I love turning things. And her aunts are married. It's a married couple. They own an antique store in a small town in the south. And I like, again, to write where they're a member of the community. We don't really dwell on it. They're accepted. We say wife a couple of times. And but, you know, the story is very much about my girl and her problems and Maleficent, you know, and but Disney let me do the representation and they're kind of modeled on the good fairies in the woods because they always gave me queer energy. <laughs> so that's a question. Of, uh, I, I apologize. Let me no, ask a question ahead. about representation. Do you feel like um, 
is it important? So I, I, I hear two strands of representation. One is the, it's very important to my child who has dark skin to see somebody like her so that she, she feels reflected in the world. And, and that could be in any kind of story where it's not relevant. And then there are stories that actually reflect the, well, uh, 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 David, to your point, maybe it is relevant, but my point is you could have a very light touch and just include the characters, or you could have the story be about that. And yes, the less stories we have, the less options we have to play with this, but the more stories, the more options. But like, is, I mean, is the answer in the question, is it that we just need a lot more so that, because I hear some people saying, I don't want to read another gay bashing story. I just want to read a gay story. You know, yeah. uh, what are your thoughts on that? Including fun, fun sex time, you know, it's like, yeah. yeah. I'm all, you know, like we deserve to have that too, right? Not just, you know, hetero romance stuff. Um, and there's right. a lot of that that goes on in romance fiction. Um, I think both are important. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think yeah, we I need think diversity of narratives. I think both are absolutely critical. It depends on how di didactic you want your story to be. You know, the left hand of darkness was brought up earlier, and that was based on Ursula asking the question, what if there is no gender? Mm -hmm. And that became the basis for that story. And it was a very pointed exploration of a society without a lack of gender. And it was a big part of the story. Or uh, uh, Rika Aoki's Light from Uncommon Stars, like the transgender character and her traumas are central to that story. But you have plenty of stories where it's really just about these people who are queer, who are BIPOC existing and being happy. And... Again, for us writers to push against certain terrible tropes like the kill you, bury your gaze trope, right? Mm -hmm. um, both of these are important, sometimes both in the same story, but also in separate stories. They need to be in a whole bunch of stories. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a feminist perspective, too, that comes in with Ursula K. Le Guin, because, you know, growing up as a woman, even now, I mean, it's a, it is wild, um, the discrimination and the second class citizenship. And of course, there's such a regression across many levels, targeting many sorts of people going on at this moment, legally speaking. A lot of this is coming from the Supreme Court. It's not even about, at this point, the presidential race. And these justices are young and they're going to be there. Yeah. For such a long time. Um, that's why I always said love or hate Hillary, it doesn't matter. The Supreme Court was a reason to vote for her, no matter what you thought about her. And, you know, that ship has sailed in a hundred different ways. And we have this court now. And I think, you know, and I say this again, because I do get a ton of mail from kids. I get a lot of mail from eight to 12 year olds. And it, it's amazing what they'll say, I, or even adults. I had an adult write to me in um, my Hades book. I did homeschooling, which I know isn't related to being queer. Because um, it just occurred to me that there are kids that don't go to school for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's disability. Sometimes it's handicapped. Sometimes it's religious reasons. And I just wanted to reflect that. So a kid could read that and see it. And I got a letter from a, a woman saying, if this book had come out when I was a kid, it would have been my favorite book forever. Because I was homeschooled and nothing I read as a kid reflected anything that looked like my life. And I yeah. felt weird and I felt out of place and I was home and I was isolated. And, you know, those that's just one example of a type of representation. And you can take that and extrapolate it to all of these things. Um, and I think, you know, what's interesting about science fiction in particular is we're introducing concepts that are technology based that our future, not always, I always say, of course, Star Wars is in the distant past, but, you know, we're introducing aliens and aliens can have whole other constructs for reproduction, whole oh, other yeah. constructs for dynamics. And, and, you know, let me in is very much, I, I call it my young adult arrival is very much about communication um, and how we communicate and how we even think in terms of communication. And it gives us such a tool to explore. And I, you know, I'm obsessed with uploading. I, I, I want to be uploaded into um, an Android or AI. Like that's how you live forever, I think. But, you know, and when we start to think about that kind of stuff, then we're really going away from gender as a basis for existence in a, in a way, if you think about very kind of heady concepts. And I think science fiction is the most obvious place for this kind of um, mm. exhibition and literature. And I think, again, this is why we see this groundbreaking stuff. And, you know, um, not, not a huge fan of the new Star Wars movies, but for reasons that involve story and directing, but the casting, that's how you do it, right? Um, you know, and again, it, it, we're, we have aliens, we have all these things going on, we have Jedi, we have all kinds of stuff. Um, but seeing characters like Ray, right, like Fen, um, and I wish I, I, I wanted my gay love story between um, Fen and what's the hot pilot's name? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I 
Kyle Poe Dameron. Dameron. In that whole movie, they're the only two people with any ke romantic chemistry, in my opinion. Those two. It is interesting that Disney appeared to be basically Disney does a wonderful company. We love Disney. No, but not really. They, but that's, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they definitely will suddenly back off an opportunity for oh, inclusion. Creating. I yeah, thought Rose, I was like, Rose was blocking. I was like, Rose, get out of there. <laughs> like, yeah. What are you yeah, saying? Yeah, no, and what's really amusing is both those actors were down for it. They would have yeah. run with that. They 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 knew they had good chemistry. Neither of them is, you know, queer music or homophobic at all. And they they would have been down for it. And, but and didn't they have chemistry on screen? I'm not crazy, right? No, like, no. Uh, trust me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. My little my little pansexual heart was beating every time the two of them were together. Like, oh my I know God. everyone writes Raylo fiction. I'm like, what's my Fen Po? Fen yeah. Po Po Fen. Yeah, I mean, there's some of there's some of that slash fiction out there, but it is a little bit harder to find than than the. It's Raylo. so funny to think that's where slash fiction started, right? David was was Kirk, yeah, Kirk and Spock, was, right? Kirk with, slash Spock, yeah. With, yeah, with Spock and Kirk, yes. Oh, that, that, that I've been that doing a rewatch. So my 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 daughter and her girlfriend, um, or her partner, I guess I should say, live. Uh, in a like a little apartment on my property, and um, m my daughter Charlene, the the one who collaborates with me on graphic not on um, the graphic novel series Feathered Serp uh, the Tales of Feathered Serpent, um, and I've been they were really interested in Star Trek about a year ago, and so I've been doing like this rewatch of like key original because they're they're interested in Kirk and Spock, so I've been doing a rewatch with them of the original series key episodes, um, and then the movies while also watching um, Strange New World and um, yeah. And discovery and stuff like that, and so it's it's really neat to watch the show from a slash perspective, um, because it, I, frankly, in the original series, there's not a lot of character development. You know, there's a lot of reset buttons on every episode, but if you watch it from that Kurt slash Spock perspective, it is a much richer show. And so, um, and and it's to to me upon rewatching it and and like it, it, you know fully in my queerness, watching it with a with a, a couple of queer people. It is, it's so much, I don't know. It just makes the show better. Um, well, doesn't yeah. Spock, I say this, I'm autistic. Is, is that, you know, doesn't, isn't Spock like autistic, like allegorically kind of? Like I think allegorically, whole, sure. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. I get that vibe from him too. And there's a lot of neurodivergence that goes along with, you know, being gender, feeling gender queer, feeling out of, you know, sync with a lot of the way, way our brains work is different. Um, and so I feel like, you know, that's fun. I'm such a TNG girl though. I'm, I'm all about. <laughs> that's the last Riker. Part of TNG. Yeah. Riker. He's so hot. <laughs> well, do you remember Riker actually had, I'm trying to remember the. There was that episode where he, where he fell in love with a character on a non-gender world. That's who right. To express their gender identity as female. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, which is convenient for Riker. That was so forward looking. That was, oh, by the way, I want to throw out, I would, I would feel like if, if anybody watches this and they're like, hey, what can I be watching that has good queer rec rep representation? In fact, after I say mine, I think you guys should rec recommend some stuff. But the new Fantasy Island, which sadly has now been canceled, but it has two seasons. So like 44 episodes, this is a network show, was like runaway aggressively queer. Like it, it, the, the, you know, it, 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 it dealt with queer issues left and right. And it, it was. And it was joyful and it was tear jerky and it was great. And it, it kills me that nobody watched it because they were like, hey, we're doing a show nobody's watching and we're doing some crazy, wonderful stuff. But you could watch it all for free, like on Tubi and, and other places. So, yeah, so definitely. I wish there was more. I mean, I feel like the new interview with the vampire series. Um, but mm. Anne has always, Anne Rice has always had this so strong in her books. Um, you know, they were really um, cult classics before they came bestsellers, passed around the queer community um, way back when they, and you got to interview the vampires written in the seventies. It is so transgressive. Yes. That's why yes, I love exactly. horror. And I think horror in particular, um, it's already supposed to be transgressive. If you're not upsetting someone, like, what are you doing, right? <laughs> and that's why, you know, her books and, and Clive Barker, you know, who is one of my heroes. Yes, totally. Phenomenal. Yeah. And like Hellraiser, everyone says, what's your favorite horror franchise? And I've worked on a lot. I worked on the Text Chainsaw Massacre remake. I worked on Freddy versus Jason. I worked at New Line for years. Um, my favorite is Hellraiser. I'm obsessed with Hellraiser. 
And, um, you know, having had conversations with Clive and spent time with him, a lot of that was him grappling with his own sexuality um, and coming to terms with it. Um, you can read about his backstory when he was writing Books of Blood. Um, and I think when you watch the imagery that is in, you know, and the movies go in these interesting directions, but the novella he wrote, which is The Hellbound Heart, um, it, it, if I, I can, if I reread it, I stay up for three days. His stuff scares me in a level. I can read Stephen King till the cows come home. I'm chill, except for maybe Pennywise. He's, he's the worst of, but he's fun. Pennywise is fun. Clive's is the eroticism of, of, I want you guys to give your, your recommendations, but I do have to ask this. Is the eroticism of Hellraiser the, the, which is a, a masochistic yeah, BDSM eroticism. kind of it's, erotic. It's, it's it's about basically transcendence through pain, right? Is that an allegory for just alternate eroticism, or 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 what? Well, what it's also that? a fear of of his own sexuality. I believe that he, you know, I say horror authors are pretty pathologically writing about their deepest fears. I mean, you see mm -hmm. it in Stephen King, and a lot of times they're not even consciously aware. It's like Stephen King wrote The Shining, which is clearly about his greatest fears. And he'll yeah. never write and do this interesting work again. It's about writer's block, alcoholism. It's a, take all the haunting out of it. It's about a dad who has writer's block, who falls off the wagon. And we know he's a history of abusing his son and tries to kill his family. And it's his fears of destroying his family through his alcoholism, which he's very publicly written about and not writing. Like what else yeah. is Stephen King afraid of? And so for Clive, you know, particularly because this is earlier of his work, I think he was grappling with a lot of his own, I don't call them demons because I don't think that's a kind way to term it. But, you know, he's a bit older. It's a different generation, um, you know, and I always say I look at the kids now. I think there has been generational progress yeah. that I see in like Gen Z and, and Alpha and whatever is coming compared to I'm uh, that weird zennial upper millennial, lower um, Gen X um, from me. And then if you go up a generation or two, which is Clive, for example, it, he's from England. It's, it's different, right? The, yeah. What we're and so I think it is about alternate sexualities and things and pain because it's not about hell. That's what's cool about Hellraiser. I always say that. I don't know if the, the, the title of the movie is the title, but it's a, it's a really effed up relationship. Is uh -huh. what it is. It's like this Frankenstein kind of, and it's basically people who seek pleasure, the ultimate pleasure and how far do you push it? And then it's a Pandora's box story, of course. Um, but, you know, which, we, which we've seen that storyline in a million erotic stories. Yes. But he's turning it into heart. All right. I want to get you guys recommendations of, of LGBTQ. Um, uh, Chris, do, do you have what where where would a listener go? Uh, you know, I want to I want to see positive LGBTQ representation. Like, what would you recommend? Uh, the books of Everina Maxwell. Uh, you've got uh, Winter's Orbit and Ocean's Echo are really great uh, sci fi gay romance. Uh, I really loved uh, Freya Marsk's trilogy. It starts with A Marvelous Light. That is very open door romance. The first book is gay. The second book is sapphic. The third book comes back to gay. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned I mentioned earlier, yeah, yeah, it's kind of a wild trip. Um, Rika Aoki's Light from Uncommon Stars. Uh, I feel like a lot of what I read has a lot of queer representation in it. It's, That's it's wonderful. So all over the place nowadays. David, what would you point to? Um, let's see. Well, uh, my friend uh, Malka Older has a, a new book, uh, The Mimicking of Known Successes, which is just an amazing, uh, really cool, like mystery um, on you know on platforms around Jupiter, and it's also like a queer romance at the same time, and it's really just a really marvelous book. Um, so that's one recently that I've read. Also. Um, really am into right now the Locked Tomb series that begins with Gideon the Ninth. Um, uh, it's it's like uh, lesbian necromancers you know, that are mm -hmm. trapped in, in a in in a massive palace and have to figure stuff out. So it's really really good. And it's the first in in a in a really great series of uh, books. You had me at lesbian necromancers. I'm like, like, I mean, right? Is it no. that you? Not much <laughs> else you can. Just... <laughs> there's also um the uh stina um i always mispronounce her last name like you, you you know her jason she's like from the austin area i'm sure you've met her before um and she's got a great book at, um persephone station that mm -hmm. had a okay. sequel recently come out and that's another really really great queer uh, science fiction story um you know the the work of 
of Nora Jemison of N.K. Jemison also has got some, lots and lots of really great queer characters. Yes, she is. I'm obsessed like, with her. I fangirl over her so hard. I went to the Launchpad Astronomy Workshop for Writers a year after she was there, and it is where she got the idea for this season. And I know exactly the lecture where she got the idea mm, from. But her, so cool. her, just on a pure craft level, she blows my mind. Like I was like, she who is. can do second person and make it work? Oh, she can. It's, it's hard to do it, and that's also one of the hard. That's a lot too. Um, series. There uh, a couple of uh, YA. Um, anthologies that I really recommend people check out and not just because I'm in them but because they have yeah. like, a lot of really really good stories uh, many of which are queer and so there's um, Reclaim the Stars mm -hmm. which is a, uh, a, a Latino um, or Latine um, anthology of, of why Latina science fiction stories most I guess there's some fantasy thrown in um, that is edited by Soraya Cordova. I know and her. She's a friend of mine. I love her. Is it? Oh my God. She's, she's, I know she's her from the YA friend. scene, you know, in um, yes. LA, it, it, you know, from back in the day. I, I, hopefully she remembers me. <laughs> she probably she's, does. I mean, she, she's really awesome. And um, and then there's this, which is coming out really soon. It's, it's relit, uh, edited by Sandra Proudman. Um, and it is um, 16 Latinx remixes of classic stories. Oh, and cool. a lot of them are remixed into sci-fi. Like I have a, a sci-fi remix of Hamlet in here. A, a Latin Fun, I love that. Yeah. Which has, you know, you were talking a little while ago, uh, Jennifer, about this idea of how we can use sci-fi concepts as um, stand-ins for it. And it, it has to, it deals with being uploaded into a robot body as a stand-in for that kind I of, um, you know, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. the, the, the 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 strange um spectrum on which we often find ourselves where we're like constantly adjusting and trying to figure out exactly what is it that I am because it is not a perfect um series of little boxes that we can fit ourselves in and um you know that's you know one of the reasons that I'm really really excited about reading like Chris's stuff and this you know exploration of of intersex and like the you know, all the people who rail against like trans identity and this and other thing um and say there are two it's just like these two compartments and you'd follow one of them and you're like i dude just flatly biologically speaking that's bullshit <laughs> well, <laughs> well, there's also, you know there's the spectrum of sexuality which exactly I've, and of on. it's funny though because when i grew up and i tell kids this now we didn't have all the terminology like where i no. we, and i identify as bisexual because that's what it was we, you were either straight bi or gay there wasn't yeah, that was it. there wasn't even there. on the <laughs> radar at where i was growing up and like yeah. so now there's all these terminology and words for all kinds of variety of things sapiosexual pansexual i mean we could go yes. on you know i am really big in into and interested in things like non-traditional relationships polyamory ethical non-monogamy which i think um is something that hasn't come fully into acceptance at all but when you right. start to look at like where the um, construct we live in, because these are constructs, marriage is a construct, right? These are all things that are kind of foisted on and how we still kind of adhere to that in such crazy ways where it might not even serve best interests of families, children, you know, the single family model we're in where we've lost community and, you know, it, it's wild stuff. So these things to me go hand in hand, like not different types of relationships, different structures for them you know, I think go hand in hand with these explorations. And when we start to introduce aliens, which we were just talking about, where they could have whole other ways that they live, reproduce, communicate. Octavia you know. Butler comes to mind in all of Oh, her. I'm obsessed with Octavia Butler. She's, yes. And that's what's cool when you write this kind of stuff. I think you really kind of have to open your mind. If you're not open mm. and thinking about things and looking at the constructs, what are you doing in science fiction, speculative fiction? Like, this is our job, kind of. You know, in terms of good representation, I was Elsa Frozen Disney. I wrote yeah. an Elsa story. I've been wanting to write Elsa forever, and I've been asked for years, "What Disney villain do you want to write that you haven't written?" And I would always say, "She's technically a princess, but she's a villain for half the film, and it's oh. Elsa." I want to write freaking Elsa. She's my favorite princess. Why? Because she's the gay princess. She that really story comes that the El Frozen Two comes this close. It does. To it turning out that 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 she's that it, she's in this this queer relationship, and then 
once again, they step away at the last minute from. Well, because it is Disney, but, and, you know, and I, and I get to some degree not wanting to over voice it, but it's there to me. And for a while I was like, is she asexual? I don't think she is asexual. I do think she's a fabulous ice princess. Um, <laughs> I think there's a reason why little girls are still so obsessed with her. Um, yeah. she's phenomenal, but I will tell you when I got my rules for the brand management for what we could do with Frozen, the big number one rule was no love interest for Elsa. And to me, that was as close as they can come to saying she's gay without saying it. If that's, that makes that sense. That is correct. Yeah. That's her a friend, right. Um, or saying that she's different because how many of their princesses don't have a love interest? Uh, let me, let me actually turn that into a question because I'm thinking now about, um, about I, I I know we've got other stuff to talk about besides representation, but this is so fascinating to me because it seems like one thing that you guys are saying is that representation is important for people seeing themselves and exploring different ways that they could be or reflecting their own existence. But it seems like it also has a rhetoric, has a I don't know, uh, has a has it has an outward looking purpose because I know that people began to accept gay men more after Will and Grace existed. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, it's a means of communicating with people who are not queer and saying, hey, these are these are your friends. These are your, the, and, and I wonder if maybe that's why there's such angry pushback in among parent, among conservative parents in the country, because they know exactly that that will happen. They, they don't well, want to be. It's easy to hate someone when you don't it's this thing that's far yeah. away that you don't interact with, yeah. interact with, you know, and we went from Seinfeld, you know, not that there's anything wrong with it, which by the way, at the time was a fairly groundbreaking thing to even have to Will and Grace. Um, and I think it's- I like, hadn't thought about that. that yeah, the, there's-, not, there's not, yeah. But, you know, they, they weren't really doing sitcoms about that even. And, you know, uh, and I think when, you know, once they, they live next door to you, they, you know what I'm saying? And your kid's yeah. best friend has two mommies or has, you know, a polyamorous couple raising them as Los Angeles. Or, you know, the kids are having different pronoun things that they're doing now. Um, it, it It's hard to to dislike to the same way when you, you don't have that humanistic and I think humanizing, which is what we do in storytelling when we're writing characters um, mm. and, and showing empathy. Um, and they show that people who read score off the charts higher on empathy. So I, I always say to parents, the number one thing you can do for your kids is get them into reading. And I always mm. say it does not matter what they want to read, you know, because it will be a gateway to other maybe more challenging things, I guess. I mean, I was obsessed with Nancy Drew. I would read a book a day. I was obsessed. And my parents got really scared that I'd never read anything else. And they paid me $10 to read The Hobbit because my dad's a huge Tolkien. Oh. And that led to me working on Lord of the Rings and like working at New Line. Um, $10 well spent. But I always say that, you know, um, the more you read, the more you're reading about different lives and things. And that's, again, where the representation comes in. And so, um, these sorts of things can change how we relate. And that's, that's again, like it's one thing to watch television or news and they're like, we hate, oh yeah, there's book, book banning going on again. Um, we don't like this category of, of whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And another thing when your kid goes to school and their best friend or your neighbors who are really nice, who you really like, or like your favorite sitcom, Will and Grace, right, is, is showing this. Um, it starts to change how much acceptance there is. And it, it's all imperfect, right? Yeah. Um, but I always say one person, you know, change one person's mind. That's one person, you know, in books, you know, the more people who read them, the more you can reach, you know, and that's why I bring up Disney because Disney, there, there's a lot of problematic things about Disney without a question. They're a huge corporate entity, um, but their reach in terms of kids is astronomical you know? Wow. And when you start to think about, you know, kids programming, kids books, this is why Judy Bloom is still a hero forever and always. Yes. You know? Yes. Right. Uh, because people saw themselves in Are You There, God? It's, it's me, Margaret. Uh, Chris um, uh, and David, I, I'd love to get your perspective on that. Chris, what strikes me is I really enjoyed reading um, your character of Elise because she uh, she's this person who just by nature is constantly changing her limbs her body essentially is constantly changing. And her partner is somebody who uh, who literally can change his entire person. Um, uh, and uh, David, you had a question, go for it. No. 
Uh, Chris, did you want to answer that? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what happened to the the, the, the question there, uh, yeah. but I have a thought. Yeah, I lost the question. Oh, my 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 question was just about about representation, which was. Uh, um... Oh yeah, yeah, but for other people, yeah, and I think especially part of that is realizing what we're fighting against and that the, the right has been trying to anger its base for a long time. Like the other day uh, I was on the news that apparently Ron DeSantis had said the phrase transing kids, mm. which doesn't even make sense. And, but like, that's the viewpoint that they're trying to instill in people that somehow we are trying to indoctrinate or uh, their children to become queer to become other and it's like no we're just welcoming them to be who exactly who they are and if they're straight cis cool if they're not also equally cool mm -hmm. um but that's what we're fighting and so that's why we're getting all these book bans and that's i because yeah i think as a writer your empathy has to be through the roof to write believable honest characters uh to have villains that can be empathetic let alone your heroes I don't, oh, exactly. believe, I don't even believe in villains. I believe uh, your antagonist is just someone who has a it's, different opposing ethic to your that's what I say. protagonist. That's why I was so and, excited to write Darth Vader because Anakin is my favorite Star Wars character. Yeah. I got tired of the Darth Vader story, but it's what you're saying. It's all point of view. Yeah, and so you need people to read perspectives that aren't their own to understand like these are just people and they have the same fears and desires and more hurdles in life because they're different maybe the right person will read and go oh i think i've been one of those hurdles yeah and that's there's a big thing because i i teach as well and there's a big thing because it's come up with just who has permission to write certain stories and this is a very big deal and i have a really strong perspective on this because i think some of this got pushed too far on some levels and i think um, every writer should have permission to write all kinds of characters. If mm. we can only write ourselves, how limiting is that? And I don't want to write about myself. I specifically write crazy stories because I don't want to write memoir. I don't want to write about my life. That's my nightmare. But of course, you end up writing yourself into everything you write, no matter what. But um, my big thing is is would be aware of cultural appropriation. There are certain stories, especially um, narratives that are really concentrating on identity, um, that do need certain authors right? And that is the distinction um, versus having a story with the representation in it um, of characters that are very different from you on, on many different levels, you know, not it's just... The, it's the American dirt problem. It's um, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like and I, both Ralph Ellison and Toni Morrison uh, wrote essays about says, how white writers need to write diverse characters as well. Um, so... While at the same time, we need to prop up own voices stories. Exactly. And it's like, I'm very comfortable having written Dr. Facilier from Princess and the Frog. I'm very comfortable having written him. But my book is not about identity. I'm not meditating on that. But my characters have that representation. But I should not write a coming of age story set on a Native American reservation. Right. Um, that should be the roundhouse. That's always Erdrich. Right. Like, there's also there's so much Star Trek references in that. But, you know, I think... Um, giving writers permission, even if you are cisgender white guy to write, because I always say like, what if they're like, you can't write women? No, you, you can write women. You, Cormac McCarthy couldn't do it. But you know, he, he admits it. He and, and I respect him for that. He he literally came out and said, I'm divorced this many times. I don't understand women still. Therefore, I can't really write them as characters. Um, this is a true story. But you know, there are certain things I'm collaborating with an author who I really recommend named Kelly Ann Jacobson. Um, and mm -hmm. she has two YA queer retellings out. One is Tink and Wendy. It's so good. Um, her Robin and her Misfits sapphic just came out. Um, she also has a really cool epistolary science fiction called Weaver that got a starred review recently. Um, we're collaborating on a gender bent Sleeping Beauty retelling with some queer storyline stuff in it. I'm about to finish over the weekend, my POV and behind. Um, but there are interesting ways, and you mentioned a remix, to take these stories. And I got into that because when I was working on Maleficent and Sleeping Beauty, I was like, this is the most anti-feminist story of all time. Sleeping Beauty is so rapey. <laughs> like, the consent is a huge problem in the fairy tale. Um, and it's my favorite movie growing up because I love Maleficent. As a little girl, I thought she was so cool. Um, but to take it and I gen and gender bend it, where suddenly it's a sleeping prince. 
so you have like a sleeping dude, you know, essentially who gets awoken. And our, ours is a big jumping off point to a portal fantasy and a bunch of things. But, you know, it's like thinking about these stories that maybe we grew up with and how can we reinvent this archetype or this trope and like turn it on its head and to kind of, and that sort of exposes some of the issues. Um, it's like one of my favorite authors and mentors is Victor Laval, who I think is doing some of the most incredible work along with N.K. Jameson. And I think they both live in Queens. But Victor, um, when we were hanging out, we were talking about how influenced we are by Lovecraft. I just did something for Weird Tales and, you know, but his stuff is so racist. So <laughs> racist. And you can't be a horror writer without having a foundation. It's a big conversation right now. What the hell do we do with Lovecraft? But, but. It's I foundational. Wanna, I, it, it, you know, it's to Hulu. But he rewrote, he took the most racist story, which is um, about the... Uh, uh, Battle at Red Hook or whatever it's called and he rewrote it as a ballad of Black Tom and won the Shirley Jackson Award where he retold Lovecraft from Black Tom's point of view mm -hmm. and that's the kind of work that I think is really kind of interesting now but yeah what do we do with Lovecraft? <laughs> uh, but I don't I, I, I want to I want to turn towards something else which is you guys talking directly towards writers as opposed to readers and the, we had two questions that we had thought about about writing one was just what do you need to take into account as a writer just thinking about the reality of especially if you're writing for young people the reality of schools and libraries and and angry parents with bonfires or whatever the hell they're doing and um uh and then just some practical stuff about about how to establish yourself but if we don't get to the social media that's fine but uh but i um what if somebody listening to this is a writer and wants to get a, get into writing, especially um, queer friendly um, sci-fi and fantasy, what do you have to bear in mind if you're trying to put yourself out there in the world? Is there anything special that you need to know? Chris, do you want to take a crack at that? I mean, I'm at it with empathy first and foremost, um, especially if you're writing people who aren't you. Uh, my first book in the Jayu City series, uh, I have a friend who is transgender and uh, gender fluid and a writer who I got feedback on, particularly for Quinn. And that's Elisa's partner, who is the one who uses nanobots to change their body literally every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I have another friend who is asexual. She's, she's arrow ace, but still to get the feedback on Elise, who is asexual and romantic but to still like that was huge huge things to help me write that person correctly mm. and as far as a book banning ban my stuff you know what banned books are the best granted i'm not aiming for teens and, and school libraries but uh i'll just join the fight that's Did fine by say me. a banned book is a book worth reading right yeah every time every no, i will tell I, I will say um so, you know, in my record on being public and my activism around these issues that we've been kind of like talking about in the last five minutes or so is is out there. And, you know, I wrote an article for the New York Times as one of the founders of Dignidad Literaria and the fight against not American Dirt, the book, but the idea behind picking a book by somebody outside of a community as the, the vehicle for the conversation about their plight um and I, you know it, i i have the dubious you know honor of having been like mentioned by oprah winfrey and her like screed against all of the stuff that we were doing on huh. that special that she kept secret and filmed out in the desert it was a really it was an amusing time <clears throat> but a lot of people have misunderstood the message of the the you know the largely mexican-american authors who were opposed uh, to that book and, and you know made such a big deal and finally got Macmillan to sit down and negotiate with us. The problem wasn't that Janine Cummins had decided to write this book. The problem was that you know, well, I guess there were like two problems. One of them was with the industry. The industry, you know, spending millions of dollars to option that book and to sell the, the movie rights and to anoint it as the book of the season, um, going so far as to you know get another. Um, flat iron um, imprint author, uh, Oprah Winfrey, to put it on her and, and her, um, uh, we call it her book club and stuff like that and, and feature it in her her magazine, O oh, and stuff like that. And just all this behind the scenes kind of gross, like making a bestseller happen, um, which 
it's a real thing the New York Times. yeah it is and yeah. the the um the point wasn't so much i mean that 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 was the gross thing they could have they could have uh optioned 50 books by latinas that were that have had those experiences or whatever paid each of them you know a 35,000 to 50,000 dollar advance and just really broadened as jason has suggested broadened the, the 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 spectrum of books that are being published rather than reducing everything to that one thing so but then the the, the other I issue is an issue of author craft just like you said before jennifer that a lot of the the the, the, the problems with this white future is a problem of world building the problem that people have is a, is, a, is a craft problem they do not know how to write about people other than themselves they want to include people who are unlike them because whatever for whatever reason maybe because they're they have a, a good heart and they want to do that or because it's trendy whatever it happens to be but they don't have the skills the requisite skills to do it because they don't they can't even write about themselves well they don't even understand themselves their own identity they can't like turn the light of evaluative uh, analysis on themselves uh, much less do that with other people like you can't you're not going to be able to put you're not going to be able to have a black protagonist or even really a black secondary character if you never have had contact with black people, if you don't huh. live alongside black people and, and like have friends who are black and have eaten in their homes and held their babies and stuff like that. Like how, the, how, how do you hey, do You that? have to do the work. And my new book, A Sacrifice of Blood and Stars, which is about Space Force, but I was writing it before Trump created Space Force. I had to redo the whole world build when Trump did that whole blah, 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 Space Force. And then you're like, is it real? Did he blurt out what was in his head? Did he share military secrets? And then it is real. A year later, Mike Pence made the speech. They funded it. It is the fifth branch of the military, et cetera, et cetera. My main character is African-American and the other one is Asian-American, but we're 150 years in the future. And like I said, everything has changed culturally speaking. We're in the California Federation. There's a whole fragmenting of earth. Um, but the interesting thing is, you know, and I did write that as a um, non-BIPOC author, these characters, sure. but that said, it this book very much meditates on dual coming of age. What is it like to enroll in the military and go to basic training in space versus a university, which are divergent experiences that 18-year-olds, my partner is a veteran. Um, I went to Harvard. We had very different you know, young adult experiences um, taking these paths. And so, and it is a romance at heart, but what's interesting is I wrote it, obviously the cover will reflect the characters, um, but we did the audiobook casting and with Podium Audio, they're the top audiobook publisher for sci-fi and fantasy. This will be their lead title in the fall, um, but I cast it and we were able to give jobs to two actors voice actors for these characters who will continue with them through the trilogy series. And that's some of the, what we're talking about is when we do these, make these choices as writers, which I did in my dark room, you know, during COVID, during Trump, <laughs> trying to yeah. like, where he's campaigning about this whole, and my book is a warning about militarization of space and proxy wars in space and all the sci-fi craziness and aliens, um, you know, but the, the, there is more to it than just, you know, me. You know, because yeah. then the readers will also take something. These actors have jobs now and characters they can inhabit and perform, which I think is super cool. I love audiobooks. Yeah. I think that's yeah. audio I'm cool. assuming that, you know, in terms of craft and, and rather than in terms of like impact, that, you know, you did the work. You, you, you did, you know, the work that needed to be done. And, you know, the problem is that some authors don't do the work, right? And, well, and, and beta authors... readers, yeah, like what Chris was saying, right? That you get yeah. someone to look at it. Yeah, you, exactly. Just like if you're writing a book that's like, you know, uh, imagine like a like a Michael Crichton book from the like seventies that has all this technical stuff. Well, Michael would go to this freaking yeah, you know, right. to friends yeah. and say, "Hey, can you check my my science here and make sure that I'm not like writing a bunch of nonsense?" And they'd be like, "Oh, dude, you need to fix this." So it's the same kind of thing. There's, you know, a lot of people got up in arms a few years ago about you know uh, these. Um, uh, cultural sensitivity uh, uh, readers, which is just a bad term for them. They're a terrible they're experts. Term. They're experts in in a particular field. So, yeah. like, it's, they're experts in the culture, or whatever. Um, you know, doing reads, and I to this day I do that. You know, you get you're writing about something that's just, um, you know, maybe publishers hire out of your lane. Publishers regularly. I I do Disney I hired do um, reads all the time. Like nearly every major book that's been published in the past five to six years that has Mesoamerica in it, you know, fantasy novels that are set in, in an alternate Mesoamerica or anything that's like, you know, set during the Aztec Emperor or whatever. I have probably read that book and given my feedback. 
to the publisher. Disney did, yeah, Disney had hired, we hired on my Dr. Vassilier book, we hired a, a reader, a sensitivity reader. I agree, I don't like the term. Yeah. Um, there were no changes, but it was the extra step. Yeah. But, exactly. And that's a wonderful thing to have happen. The sensitivity, sensitivity reader is like, you nailed it. You got yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, and, I, think, I, think, I think both are wonderful, though. I think both are wonderful. No, when, when, oh, when you get feedback too, right? Yeah. Yeah, when my when my non-binary friend, they were just like, literally, this is this is the future I want as a non-binary person. The asexual, I had to completely redo several scenes because I got it wrong. Yeah, and that I've had and the same thing happen to me too. So thankful for that feedback. Well, there can also be in Disney, and this is just because I do so much writing for them. They have five branches of approval we go through with stories, and um, one of them is diversity and inclusion. I will say that they do do that, and they take it seriously. And what was so interesting, my most recent book is Circle of Terror with Scar, of course. Um, and my character is Cuban American, my little kid, and he gets moved to Arizona to the desert. Um, and again, it's absolutely about Scar and a, and a derelict haunted safari camp that they inherit and this and that. But one of the notes that came back was to add more um, Native American characters to the story in my setting in Arizona and to actually add more um, diversity than even was in it to start with. And I thought that was kind of cool, actually. Yes. Good. You're like, good on you, Disney. For I was like, sweet. That. I was like, sure thing. I can I will add that. Yeah. Yeah, let's do some more. Sure, let's push this even more. Um, so I will say that there are bright spots um, mm -hmm. within all of this. Um, for writers who are thinking of writing, um, sometimes it depends on how sensitive and where you live and this and that. Sometimes pen names are advised. Robin Talley is a pen name. This is my best friend from high school. Um, my co-author Kellyanne Jacobson on her latest book tour did have some issues um, with conservative media and protests. Um, she had one in Pennsylvania, an event, and this bookstore does these regularly, not just for her, of course. They were, they'd have teenagers in because she's a young adult author and they do pizza and author and books, right? And so when she was coming to town, um, a conservative media group got a hold of it. And the whole thing was that they were indoctrinating, trying to indoctrinate kids to make them gay by offering them pizza to bring them into this queer author's, you know, to <laughs> when he book tour event, even though like, you know, the week before, I'm sure somebody totally different was there with the pizza and the author. And, um, but it was an issue. They had to hire security. She almost had to pull out because they were nervous mm. um, about, because there's some crazies and some crazy things going on right now in this arena. David um, and I have a number of friends in Texas who have been yeah, uninvited. Who, like, yeah. Who have been uninvited or literally at the end of a week long um, series of author visits um in Northside is that anything I'll like just like name them um even though I did a, a I did the following I didn't know this while I was doing the following week my school visits but the previous week they had a a, a queer author and a uh, a gay author and they um they put in the contract the clause that if he used the word gay that at that moment he that he would no longer be able to finish his week and on Right. on the last session on on his thursday he said the word gay and they were like nope 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 that nope. is shocking oh my and god i can't believe that. that's, the that's, don't gay. that's florida too and teachers yep. are scared too to carry books or to push um certain books i have a lot because i do i do adult fiction as well sacrifice and blood and stars is technically new adult but i do so much middle grade and ya work and we talked about zora ida but that um in this community i mean we're being targeted probably the young adult and middle grade authors more than anyone in terms of the book banning because and the school market and the library market is so significant to us yeah. um and yeah. i always say it's also an access issue because you know when i was a kid i didn't have a lot of money you know, I spent all my money on books, obviously. I always say if my parents had a Kindle, I would have bankrupted them because yeah. uh, I like to read so much. I was at Walden Books at the mall or the library and libraries are such an access situation. Schools and teachers are such an access for kids of all kinds to be able to read. I donate a lot of books um, to classrooms because some don't even have them. And when we start banning them from libraries and schools, what we're really punishing are kids who fall at more low income, right? Yeah. That's really who we're targeting with these bans because a kid who- Absolutely, yeah. Money, you can go buy the, the books, but yeah. We are over time. So I want to wrap things up by asking each of you to change course and tell us where we can find you online because that's, that's really important. So uh, Chris- um uh where 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 do we find your stuff uh i'm on instagram and tiktok at chris m arnone a-r-n-o-n-e 
uh, my books, including the newest one, Necropolis Alpha, that just came out on Tuesday, is available pretty much you, wherever you can buy books online. And of course, you can always go to your local bookstore and they can order it, which is a wonderful way to support the local bookshop. I'm all Yeah, and it's for a good that. way to support the author too. The more books get ordered at libraries, I mean that that does that mm -hmm. does work. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Um, the and you have a website. What's your what's your URL, Chris? ChrisArnone.com. All right, David. What about you? Yeah, um, so I'm on most social media platforms. I'm still on Twitter, which I will never call X. Um, oh, no. Uh, Instagram, <laughs> TikTok, everywhere. Um, and it's David and then O my, for my middle name, Oscar Bowles, David O. Bowles. Um, and then uh, my website is davidbowles.us. And you can uh, find me there. And I have a Medium account as well, where I, I put a lot of stuff. That's also David O. Bowles. Um, yeah, look me up. Excellent, excellent. Jennifer, what about you? Um, I am jenniferbrody.com. You can also type in verastrange.com and it'll route you right there. Um, I am at Jennifer Brody on Twitter, uh, Jennifer Brody Writer on Facebook and Instagram, and at Jennifer Brody on TikTok, even though I'm behind on posting. Don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to gear up, but I'm, I'm, so I'm hard. incubating. I'm writing. <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah, and so I'm pretty easy to find and my books are fairly easy to find. That's wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Guys, there's more about of this topic. That, I mean, I feel actually to do this any kind of justice, this should be a two hour panel instead of a one hour panel, or maybe three, because honestly, we could we could run down rabbit holes on all of this. But at least we got a little bit of a start of the conversation. And I'm very, very thankful for uh, for all three of you for for joining us. Um, and and I, I, I hope I get a chance to talk to all of you again. So. Um, Awesome. Uh, and yeah. uh, Thank by you the way, allyship. somebody in the audience, Chris has a sub stack. So oh, I do my, wife, my wife's oh. like, oh yeah, he has a sub stack. <laughs> I do. Uh, <laughs> has I have one too. I forget. I need to post. Jennifer Birdie. <laughs> you must be. I, I need it. to post. Well, it's been a great conversation, Jason. Thank you for your allyship, for all you all you do as you know, both a publisher, a writer, as the father of queer children. Um, you are a genuinely good person, and we appreciate you very much. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Yes. That's, that's very yeah, humbling. Thank you, Jason. And kind. You're awesome. Thanks thank for you. publishing my Namaste story, too. I love that story. That's a great story. It <laughs> it's is my really feminist, great. most dangerous game, women murder yoga yep. retreat story. It's great stuff. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Adios, everybody. Have a lovely, lovely day. Bye, you guys. Stay in touch. Find me on socials. You guys are awesome. Bye. -bye.